Okay, so I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Jack Kelly is a historian and novelist. His book, Band of Giants, won the DAR History Medal. His current book and the topic of this lecture is Valkyr, the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty. He lives and works in New York's Hudson Valley. And I'm now going to turn it over to you, Jack. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And I wanna thank uh, you and Ali and all the folks there at um, Francis Tavern. And it's really a privilege to um, be broadcasting even virtually from uh, such an august venue as this uh, very old and uh, prestigious uh, spot in New York City. Um, I'm going to switch over to a um, to a, a PowerPoint uh, slideshow. I think will help people to keep track of what I'm talking about. And the, um, if I can get the technology to together here. So I'm going to be talking about my book, Valcour, the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty. Um, I refer to this as the most important unknown battle of the Revolutionary War. And I'll get in a few minutes, I'll get to uh, give a few reasons why I think it's that. Um, the geography of the situation um, in the summer of 1776, the Patriots were facing a dire situation. The British had sent over the most, the largest expeditionary force in their history uh, to um, put down the rebellion. And the target of that army was a corridor that ran from Quebec City down the St. Lawrence River, down the Richelieu River, Lake Champlain, Lake George, and then down the Hudson River to New York. It was the main um, access to the interior of America. It was about the only route from Canada down into the, the what were then called the United Colonies. And in particular, it really served as a backdoor to New England. So if the British got onto Lake Champlain or onto the Hudson River, they could attack eastward into New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And that's where the uh, rebellion was considered to be the, the, the really the heart of the rebellion in, uh, in New England. Um, the Patriots, uh, understood the strategic significance of that quarter because they had used it the year before to invade Canada. And they went north from Fort Ticonderoga up Lake Champlain. They took Montreal and went all the way up to Quebec City. Um, you don't hear an awful lot about the invasion of Canada in the history books. I think it's uh, somewhat of an embarrassment that um, the freedom-loving patriots' uh, first inclination was to invade another colony. Uh, and also that it was a complete disaster. They, um, they laid siege to Quebec City. They couldn't take it. They were up there all winter. When the first contingent of that uh, expeditionary army uh, came over, uh, 10,000 men landed in Canada. Uh, the, the Patriot Army panicked. They, they left behind their wounded. They left behind a lot of their supplies and they retreated all the way back down the St. Lawrence, down Lake Champlain. And, back to where they'd started at these two forts that they'd taken the year before from the British of Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point. So you had a situation where there was essentially four armies. The British had two armies, one in Canada that was intending to invade southward. And the British had a much larger army in New York that was facing George Washington in New York City. The, the army that was in uh, Fort Ticonderoga was really broken army. It was um, uh, the lack order, it lacked discipline, their morale was totally shot. Uh, they'd left behind a lot of their supplies. And in particular, they had uh, contracted an epidemic of smallpox while they were in Canada. So, um, this is a, gives a view of this, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the crown point is up here. That was their advance post, and then uh, the main defenses were at Fort Ticonderoga. 
And of the 5,000 uh, men who came back from Canada, uh, 3,000 of them uh, were sick with smallpox and had to be quarantined. And this was the army in, in July of uh, 1776 that was um, what was on, the only thing blocking the British invasion from the north. And the fate of the nation in the north uh, rested on three men who are not uh, today considered among the first string of American officers. Uh, Philip Schuyler was the man in overall command. He was an Albany aristocrat. Um, he actually spoke Dutch at home, uh, as did many people in Albany in those days. Uh, Schuyler was seen as a lukewarm patriot and was not in favor of independence. He had very little battle experience and he was chronically ill. So he did most of his commanding from his mansion in Albany. His man on, on the spot at Fort Ticonderoga, the field commander, was Horatio Gates. Um, Gates was a former British officer, quite experienced as a, as a staff officer, but not like Schuyler, he was not really a battle leader. Um, and uh, he also had a very exalted view of his own abilities uh, and was continually plotting as to how he was going to replace George Washington as head of the Continental Army. And the man who would actually be taking the fight to the British was none other than Benedict Arnold. Um, Arnold had virtually no military experience before the war. Uh, he had shown some promise in Canada, but of course, four years later, he would betray his country. So it seemed like bad luck that these um, three men in particular were the commanders in this very crucial situation. But strangely enough, they proved to be um, the right men for the job. Uh, Schuyler was a genius of logistics. Uh, he had been a businessman, he had very wide connections and they had to, to buy and ship supplies up to Lake Champlain um, in order to build a fleet in order to stop the British. And he was the man to do that. Uh, General Gates was a genius of organization. Uh, that was his specialty. He knew how to restore discipline to the army. He knew how to raise morale and um, organize the defenses around Fort Ticonderoga. And Benedict Arnold proved to be a genius of war itself. Uh, he had an uncanny intuition for strategy and tactics, uh, was very aggressive, um, always taking the initiative. And as a bonus, he had been a sea captain before the war, so he knew about boats and sailing, and that was essential to the strategy that they employed. So it, beginning in July of 1776, just as the nation was declaring its independence, um, an arms race began in the north, and the British were here at St. John's um, building their fleet that... The, Oh, Jack, it looks like you are muted. Yeah, I'm, there you go. What happened there? So uh, the British were building their fleet at St. John's. There are rapids between um, the St. Lawrence River and um, Lake Champlain. So you can't sail from directly from the St. Lawrence River into Lake Champlain, but you can from St. John's. And the Americans were down here in Skeensboro, the very southern tip of Lake Champlain, uh, building their fleet. Um, the Americans had started out with a, a small fleet on Lake Champlain, really had control of the lake. Uh, this was a, a schooner that they captured from the British uh, called the Royal Savage, uh, only about 50 feet long, uh, some relatively small cannon on the sides, but enough to, to um, intimidate the British from uh, descending the lake. And what they wanted to build was gunboats. Uh, this is a schematic of, of the type of gunboat that they built. Um, it had a little bit heavier cannon. Each, each gunboat had three cannon, one in the, in the bow and one on either side. Um, but it was really an oversized rowboat. Uh, it was also about 50, a little bit more than 50 feet long. Um, had no no cabins or no decks below, it was all, and 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 it had a flat bottom. the The fact that it was flat bottom made it easy to build, but 
uh, difficult to sail. Uh, it had a mast and a sail, but uh, in order to sail properly, you really need a keel on your boat, and uh, these gunboats do not have that. So the wind had to be pretty much directly from behind in order to sail with it. Otherwise, it had to be rowed. This is a, a replica of one of those gunboats. It was uh, uh, an exact replica that was constructed at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. And it gives you an idea of what they look like. Um, interesting to note that there are about a dozen people on this boat. Uh, the actual crew of one of the gunboats would have been 44. So they were very crowded with men. What the uh, Patriots really wanted was this type of boat, uh, a small ship that they called a galley or a row galley. Um, it was about 72 feet long. It had a cabin. There was a underneath this uh, uh, quarter deck. There was a small cabin. It had heavier guns along the sides. It could be rowed uh, with these long sweep oars, and it had a keel, so it could be sailed quite handily. It was good for fighting on the lake. The problem with those galleys was that they were difficult to build. They really needed an experienced uh, shipwright to know how to lay the keel and get the shape tall and so forth. And there were very few uh, experienced shipwrights out in the wilderness of uh, Lake Champlain. So um, they were slow getting going. The rigging was also quite complicated so that it took lo uh, longer than they would have liked to, to build these galleys. In August, uh, this, uh, while this work was going on of building the fleet, uh, Benedict Arnold decided to take what he had, which was they'd, they'd finished six of the gunboats and he had the uh, uh, Royal Savage schooner. And he took this tiny little fleet and went up to uh, the north end of Lake um, Champlain, uh, just below the Canadian border. In fact, he went up into the Richelieu River here. Uh, he wanted to get some intelligence about what the British were doing. Um, he wanted to train his crews, which was uh, uh, um, important because a lot of the men that were manning the gunboats were had been taken from the army, and they didn't really know anything about sailing, and they needed to get the at least learn the basics of sailing. Um, and the 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 third reason he was particularly anxious to get up there was he wanted to explore the lake. Uh, he himself and the captains of his gunboats went into. Uh, these many little coves and islands, inlets, taking soundings, uh, understanding the terrain of the lake up there. You can see how complicated it is with many, many islands. Um, down here you see Valcour Island, which will come into the story in a minute. While all this was going on, uh, and some of you are probably quite familiar with what was happening in New York, is uh, George Washington had uh, a 20,000 man army in uh, New York City. He, he barricaded the city. The British landed a, a, approximately 40,000 men on Staten Island unopposed. In August, they uh, fought a battle on Long Island. Uh, the Patriots were soundly defeated. Uh, in September, they took New York's um, city and nearly captured Washington's army. By October, they were up in uh, White Plains fighting. And then in November, um, Washington crossed the Hudson River and had to retreat all the way down to on the other side of um, the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. Um, his 20,000 man army had by that time shrunk to about 3,000. And he wrote a to his letter to his brother at that time. He said, I think the game is pretty near up. Uh, and this was the same time that Thomas Paine was um, writing his pamphlet, The Crisis, which he began, these are the times that try men's souls. And he wasn't kidding. Uh, meanwhile, Benedict Arnold's still waiting up in uh, um, the north end of Lake Champlain. Uh, they were there the entire month of September. Um, quite puzzled really why the British didn't attack. 
And it was pretty hard service for the men in the boats. The, the gunboats, as I mentioned, were just open boats. Uh, um, they, um, men had come up starting in the summer. Uh, they had were pretty much no winter clothing. Um, there were a lot of storms that came down the lake uh, in the autumn. So they were constantly wet. Uh, there were no berths or hammocks uh, or any place to sleep on the gunboats. They just simply had to sleep on the deck. Um, and they lacked um, gunpowder. They lacked, um, in particular, the galleys. Uh, Arnold kept sending back to uh, Horatio Gates and asking, demanding, where are these galleys? Or this is a main, the main arm of the fleet. Um, and they couldn't seem to get them finished. Around the first week in September, um, Arnold decided to pull back. Uh, he'd been uh, um, kind of menacing the, the British up in this area, and he pulled back to Valcour Island, um, which was protected. He wanted to be, the fleet to be protected from these storms, and also they would be hidden. Uh, Valcour Island is a little over, just barely a mile off of uh, the New York shore. They would be hidden in this little bay, and they would be closer to Crown Point and Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, soon after he pulled back there, in the first week in October, the, the galleys finally arrived. They, they sent three galleys up. Uh, Arnold switched his flagship over to one of the galleys, and that was the fleet that would face the British. They they added two gunboats as well. Uh, the the um, the, the galleys brought us a few more supplies and particularly a barrel of rum for every one of the uh, gunboats, which was very welcome at that point. So another week passed. Finally, um, on the morning of October 11th, um, lookouts that were uh, Arnold always kept out on the lake uh, came in early that morning, said they'd, they'd spotted uh, sails on the northern horizon. The British were on their way. The um, so the the American fleet is now um, in this um, Valcour Bay, which is right in here. The, the British fleet was led by this man, uh, Guy Carleton, who was a, um, a very competent soldier, had been governor of, of Canada. Um, and he was, a, he was a cautious officer, but that morning he was very confident because he had uh, spent a, an additional month, uh, this time that Benedict Arnold had been waiting for him, to build a frigate. This is a, a kind of a generic a replica of a, what a frigate of that era would have looked like. This is a, a three-masted, square rig, really ocean-going ship with a very powerful broadside of cannon. Uh, it had as much firepower as mo almost the entire American fleet. So you can see the difference between what the British were coming down uh, with uh, compared to the smaller American boats. Uh, in addition, the Carlton had um, two schooners. He had a, an artillery barge with some pretty heavy guns on it. He had 22 gunboats. Um, the Americans had eight, but the American gunboats had three cannon on them. The British gunboats had one. So that, that was fairly even in that regard. But the British had very skilled sailors from the Royal Navy, skilled gunners. And they also had a um, 3,000 man advance unit of the army waiting on shore to jump into transports and um, follow the fleet down once they dealt with the Americans. So everything seemed to favor the British that morning. Benedict Arnold, though, had a plan. Uh, he uh, had thought about the situation for all these weeks, they've been up there. And he assumed that the British would not um, sail down the lake without the wind at their back. And uh, there was a north wind, rather brisk north wind blowing that morning. And his idea was to let them go by. And I think he must have intuited that Carleton would imagine that he had, uh, that, that uh, Benedict Arnold 
and the American fleet had already fled, already retreated down the lake, uh, which would have made sense. So he didn't spend the time to investigate and explore and, and, and send out scouts to see if they might be hiding behind one of these islands or in one of these inlets. He just was in a hurry to, um, um, to sail down the lake and catch up to them. So he, uh, Arnold let, let them, um, um, British, go past the uh, Valkyrie Island. He then sent his galleys and the, and the schooner Royal Savage out and fired at them from behind, requiring them to turn around, uh, sail into the wind, and come up into this rather narrow bay. This is a contemporary map of the battle. Uh, it's not very accurate as far as the terrain of the land, but it gives an idea of the dynamics of what happened. The British gunboats, which were like the American gunboats, were basically rowboats, were able to get up and confront the Americans. Uh, one British schooner was eventually able to work its way into the bay, but the rest of the uh, larger British ships uh, never were, were able to get in. They, they, they couldn't tack they didn't have room to tack back and forth to go against the wind. And they were essentially spectators out uh, in, in this area um, while the battle went on. And the, um, the battle developed into basically a cannon duel. You can imagine a duel on, uh, on land where two men face each other with pistols. Uh, and this was similar except that they were uh, firing heavy cannon. This is a, a nine pounder uh, cannon that would have been on the side of an American gunboat. Um, and there were um, uh, up to 24 pounder cannon involved in the battle. Um, it was a very brutal form of combat. There was nowhere to hide. You couldn't take cover because the uh, cannonballs would blast through oak plank. And um, it was very stressful, very chaotic. You just had a hope you didn't get hit. Um, and a real life or death struggle for the Patriots to avoid being overwhelmed by this very superior uh, British fleet. This is an artist's conception of the um, of how the battle might have looked. Uh, this is this would have been one of the American uh, row galleys, uh, pretty well shot up at this point. Uh, but essentially, Arnold's plan worked. The uh, the British were not able to get their major ships into the battle. Um, only the ones, one British schooner, and that got pretty well beaten up uh, when, when it did get into the battle. And the, um, the battle at Valkyrie Island was basically a draw. It was a damage done to both sides. Certainly the Americans took the worst of it, um, but the British were never able to break through and um, uh, really get at the American fleet. And about 5.30, uh, the uh, darkness uh, came and the battle was over. Each side had lost one gunboat. Uh, the Philadelphia, which was an American gunboat, sank just after dark. They got the men off, but the, the boat went to the bottom. The Americans had used up about three quarters of their ammunition. Um, a lot of their ships were taking on water and they knew they would be sitting ducks in the morning when the um, when the sun came up, particularly if the wind changed, the British would be able to go down on top of them. So the they were trying to decide whether to surrender the fleet or to um, wait there and be slaughtered the next morning. And Benedict Arnold came up with a, another option, which was to escape. Um, historians still scratch their heads over exactly how the Americans got out of this trap of having the whole British fleet in front of them, and yet they were able to uh, sail south right out of uh, Valkyrie Bay and escape. Uh, but it certainly had a lot to do with learning the water. They were able to get in very close to the shore, the New York shore, um, whereas the British, who were unfamiliar with the territory, um, were wary of getting too close to the shore because they didn't want to go aground. And the Americans, um, an, another factor that is, uh, sometimes mentioned is that these cannon battle were, um, were literally deafening. And so some of the um, uh, uh, men on both sides would have been temporarily deaf. So they, they were able to, 
sneak out row down about to here that night. The British, meanwhile, are waiting still around this area. Um, the sun came up, the mist cleared, and Valcour Bay was totally empty and they were flabbergasted. Uh, Carlton went into a rage. Somebody spotted sails down to the south uh, and they began a chase. Um, the the um, British uh, ships were, the, although Americans had a head start, the British ships were faster and they came down. This is sort of the central part of the lake. Crown Point is down here. And they made it, the Americans made it as far as Split Rock and the British caught up with them. There began then another battle. Um, the B British captured one of the American galleys uh, and took 100, about 110 men prisoner. Uh, and they've started shooting up the rest of the fleet. A few of the American boats were able to escape down to uh, uh, Crown Point and then to Ticonderoga. And Benedict Arnold had four gunboats left in his uh, galley, and he began fighting with the British around in this area and down through here uh, for about two and a half hours. They had another cannon duel fight, shooting back and forth until finally Arnold uh, um, ordered his, all of his boats into this, what's a, really a tiny little cove here it's labeled Ferris Bay. Uh, and the uh, captain sailed their boats in, grounded them in Ferris Bay. The, the, the bay was too, um, too shallow for the British to follow them. They then set the boats on fire so that the British couldn't take advantage of them. And Arnold was proud of the fact that he'd never lowered the flags and surrender on the, any of his ships. Uh, finally, the, when the fire reached the, the gunpowder that was left, uh, they blew up and he was able to walk uh, his men down to uh, uh, cross over to Crown Point and, and get back to Ticonderoga. Uh, an interesting note is that uh, Ferris Bay was later, the name was changed to Arnold Bay. And that's the only spot in the United States today that's uh, named in honor of Benedict Arnold. So the British easily took Crown Point. Uh, the Americans had to abandon it and they focused their um, defenses down here at Ticonderoga, and then they waited. Um, nothing happened. Weeks went by. And for some reason, and uh, you know, it may have had to do with the fact that Carleton uh, had been stunned by the, the uh, really fanaticism, as he saw it, of the Patriots or um, who you know, stood up to the Royal Navy. It certainly had to do with his uh, understanding of how cold it got in um, the, in the northern New York at that uh, that time of year. It was already getting towards November. There was snow on the ground. He was afraid that if he attacked Ticonderoga uh, and laid siege to it, that he the lake would freeze behind him and that would cut off his supplies from Canada. Whatever the reason, uh, and it was hotly disputed decision, uh, he made the decision to take the fleet, take the army, and go back to Canada. And that was the, um, the end of the campaign. The, the Americans were amazed that, the, that it turned out that way. They were ready to fight it out at uh, Ticonderoga, uh, but they didn't need to. So I refer to this as the most important unknown battle of the Revolutionary War for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is that in 1776 was really the best chance that the British had to win the war outright. Uh, the, uh, they had the preponderance of force. The Americans were divided uh, uh, politically between uh, patriots and the loyalists. Uh, and, and especially the Americans had no allies. The French wouldn't come into the war for another year. Um, so given that this was the best chance to win, the, this campaign prevented that. Uh, the delay all summer building the fleets and then the, the further delay with the battle uh, 
it was not a victory by the Americans in any, by any definition, it was, they lost their entire fleet. But like many battles in Revolutionary War, it achieved its purpose, which was just to keep going, just to delay the British. Uh, and, it, and this year in particular, it was very important that they did that. The other reason that uh, I think it's a, an important campaign is that after the British left, uh, General Gates and Benedict Arnold took 600 men from Fort Ticonderoga and marched them down all the way to Pennsylvania to join Washington's army. And Washington was in a, um, a, a, at the point of making a decision. We can't really know all the factors that he considered, but the, the fact that the um, threat from the North had been neutralized, the fact that he had these extra 600 men may have helped to give him the uh, confidence to risk his entire army on Christmas night and uh, cross the Delaware and defeat the Hessians at Trenton, uh, one of the most important victories of the war. It restored American morale um, and basically allowed the country to survive uh, for another year. Uh, some of the men who fought at Valcour Island uh, in October also crossed the um, the Delaware and fought with Washington at Trenton in December. The gunboat Philadelphia, which I, this again is the replica of it, um, sank in Valcour Bay and sat on the bottom for 159 years. And in the 1930s, uh, divers found it and salvaged it. Uh, and this gives you an idea, really, you can sort of see here how small these boats really were. Um, it was brought up and sent to the um, Smithsonian Institute, and it's there today on display. It's the oldest uh, existing American naval vessel. Uh, and to me, it's one of the most poignant relics of the Revolutionary War, uh, because it is, it is the real thing. This is not a replica, it's not a model. This is the actual boat that floated on that lake in 1776. Um, these are the actual guns that fired uh, at the British um, the, when, they, when they found it at the bottom of the lake and brought it up, this bow gun was still loaded. And the, these planks were actually absorbed the blood of people who fought for our independence. So it's a, it's a, a memento of the war, I think it's well worth seeing if you're ever down in Washington uh, and stopped by the Smithsonian. And I just want to conclude by saying that uh, there's recently been questions raised about the, the relevance of the revolution. Uh, and people have made the point that the founders were too flawed to really be held in any regard today. And like any historian, I, I agree entirely that there's a necessity of closely examining the flaws and failings of the founding generation. Uh, but I think we also have to keep in mind that um, uh, these people f put forth an idea. Um, and it was a rather simple idea that uh, no person is superior by birth. At the time, it was a startling idea. It was when most of the world was um, uh, dominated by aristocracy and monarchy. Um, this idea that people had inalienable rights, not because of their position or the wealth, but because of that, simply because they were human beings. So I think it's helpful to focus on those who fought war because they fought for that idea uh, and they were common people. They, they uh, even many of the officers in the Continental Army were, they were not aristocrats, they were just common people. And three months after independence, uh, when no one knew who, who was going to win the war, and when the nation was divided, certainly more than it is now, uh, these men were willing to go to this remote northern lake and face cannon fire for an idea. And when they did so, they were thinking about us. And there are many references in the letters and diaries of that time to generations unborn that would profit from their sacrifice. 
So maybe in these times, you know, the, the way the country is today, learning about these people and learning about their actions and their courage and their perseverance uh, can inspire us to believe that there's still life in that idea. So that ends my presentation. I'd be very happy to take any questions you have or comments. Uh, and just uh, if you need, want to contact me or get any more information about the book, um, I'm at jackkellybooks.com. So that's. Great. Thank you so much. Go. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Allie. If you have any questions, put them in the chat now if you haven't already. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was quite interesting. And this first question I had and several other people had in the chat as well is uh, how did, exactly did 44 men fit in a boat that size? Uh, that is a very good question. And, and it was just, uh, it was crowded. That's all I can say. It's, <laughs> uh, the officers were in, as with all you know, Navy vessels, the officers had a little bit more room in the very rear of the boat, but there was no cabin even for the officers. Even the captain had his sleep on the deck or they had little platforms for the officers to sleep on, but really squeezed into the rear of the, uh, or the stern of the boat, I should say. And the rest of the men just sat down. Uh, there was some speculation because uh, they built that replica. Uh, they could sort of try out how did it go of that they, uh, just sat down. A lot of people slept sitting up in those days and they sat down and then the next guy would sit down in front of them and lean back and to, they would sort of stack themselves up across the deck just um, as, as a way of saving space mainly or and for warmth as it got colder. So yeah, there was no question. That, and uh, people have asked me too, why, why was it, why did they need 44 people? And the, like with any naval vessel, you had to be able to work the ship. You have enough men to work the ship, to fire the guns in battle, and then uh, uh, Marines who were essentially soldiers who would fight off the uh, any attempts to board. So they had muskets and were a, a unit in themselves. So that's how it added up to 44. That's a good segue into my next question, which is uh, what was training, if any, like for the soldiers that were operating these gunboats? Well, as, as I mentioned, the, um, the, one of the problems, and, and I, I have a reference in my book to uh, Benedict Arnold uh, furiously writing back to uh, General Gates, no more landlubbers. <laughs> and many of his men were landlubbers. They, were, they had been farmers before the war started. And so they had to learn very much the basics of sailing. Uh, they, the captains were as experienced men as they could get uh, in, in terms of uh, having been to sea and uh, knowing how to handle a boat. But um, the, uh, the men themselves just had to be trained. And the other thing they had to be trained in is how to fire the guns. You can imagine firing a, a cannon when the ship is rocking back and forth. It's very choppy and uh, 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 Lake Champlain, unlike uh, on the ocean. Uh, so that was also uh, something that they just needed to practice over and over again until they knew what they were doing. Interesting. Was the terrain or the conditions of Lake Champlain familiar to either of the militaries? Well, the, the um, Benedict Arnold had been up and down Lake Champlain quite a bit. He actually, as a businessman before the war, he had gone up and in, 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 into that area and uh, uh, n knew s the basics of how the lake was laid out. And he'd spent time during the summer going up and down, uh, studying the various aspects of the lake because uh, for example, if there was an island with trees on it and you were sailing once you got behind the island, you might be blocked from the wind. So you had to um, uh, take all these things into consideration. One of the disadvantages the British had, even though the, their uh, captains were very, very experienced uh, in the Navy, is that they had not been on the lake. Uh, they, they finished that frigate that I talked about and then uh, immediately sailed out on, they, there was no shakedown crews or anything. They just sailed right out onto the lake and started down after the Americans. 
Uh, so they had that unfamiliarity to deal with. They did have um, some pilots who were familiar with the lake that they'd hired to, to give them some guidance, but they didn't have the, the same uh, sense of the lake that the, the Americans did. Okay, that's a good segue into my next question, which is, you had said that historians aren't totally sure how the American troops were able to escape Valcor Bay, but how do you think they did it? Well, I hold with the idea, which mo I think most people do, that they sailed south. The, the north part of the, the, what I call a bay was actually a, a, what you might call a strait. It went through and separated the, the island from the mainland. But the northern part was very shallow. And particularly in the fall, uh, Lake Champlain goes up and down by about five feet every year just from the runoff in the spring and then it evaporates and then by the fall it's at its shallowest point so it was hard to sail out of the north and that would have put them behind the british anyway because the british had their their boats across the entire channel so they essentially uh, squeezed along this shore um, and most of the accounts uh, are consistent with that there are a few people that believe that they did go out the, the north end, but um, that's uh, speculation is not an awful lot of evidence for it. Okay, this is sort of a bigger question. Um, why did the British engage at Valcor Island at all? Why not just trap the Americans and wait for the surrender? Well, that was a, that's a good question because part of um, Arnold's uh, uncanny strategy was that he figured that if they went by and he fired at them, they would be provoked and they wouldn't, they wouldn't say, oh, let's uh, wait here and, and see if we can get better conditions for attacking them. They would feel that they, um, they needed to respond immediately and they did. And I, it was just how he understood that or what, it, whether he was just lucky, I don't know, but they could, certainly could have waited. If they waited a day, they would have won the battle because the wind did that night switch around to the south. And with the large ships that they had, they could have just sailed down on the Americans and blasted them. Okay, and next I have, did Gates, Schuyler, or Morgan uh, participate directly in the battle at all? Gates, Schuyler, or, or? Morgan, did they participate in the battle at all? Uh, well, General Gates was at uh, Ticonderoga the entire time, so he was in, con they, they always, you know, every day there'd be uh, boats rowing up and down, taking messages and back and forth, and um, he was in touch with uh, Arnold, but not in terms of, the, they, in fact, they had several alarms uh, in the, the British would come out and, and practice with their cannon. Well, the Americans could hear that. The sound travels across water, of course, very easily. And even though they were maybe 80 miles away, they could they heard some of the rumbling in the north. And um, so they were always wary. And then they'd have to wait and find out what it was. But uh, otherwise, it was a totally independent command on the part of Benedict Arnold. Uh, General Gates had given him orders that were pretty ambiguous. So it's like um, he didn't want to tell him just do what you want, but that was in effect is what he said. Okay, and um, how long did it take to build the fleet uh, used by the Continental Army, and who paid for that? Uh, well, that was it was paid for out of the general fund of the army. Uh, it was not there was no navy at the time. Uh, they they referred to this as the first navy, but there was never really a at this point, an organized navy. The some of the states had navies, but uh, the 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 colonies, the United Colonies, as they were then, uh, didn't have a navy. So this was would have been out of the general support of the of the um, of the army. And they started. Uh, they had begun even in June, building some of the gunboats. That mostly got to get, got it going in July, um, and were finished the um, the last of the galleys that they got done. Some of them they didn't even finish uh, in um, the first 
you know, the, at the end of September, the first week of October. Were the troops themselves building this boat or did they have outside help? <clears throat> no, they had, they, had, uh, they uh, tried to encourage um, uh, people with carpentry skills from the coast uh, to come up to um, the Skeensboro but that it was really the middle of nowhere. It was a really wilderness up there. And there was a great trade and a great uh, incentive to for shipbuilders to build um, a privateers down on the coast because there were a lot of money in being having a privateer, which was a, a private ship that had uh, could could uh, take prizes of British ships, uh, British commercial ships. Uh, so there was not a lot of incentive to to go up and build a ship on on a lake that and it, uh, it was difficult, but they did, you know, there was some patriotic, uh, the Philadelphia, for example, was uh, named that because it was Pennsylvania men that had come up and built it and they were, they had worked on uh, uh, on the coast, so they, they were familiar with boat building. Okay. Um, and so what kind of damage or how much damage i guess would cannon fire do to each of these boats well the the uh it, um, a cannonball a direct hit would go through i think the the general rule of thumb was about four inches of oak plank which was about what the sides of those ships were so uh there's actually uh if you if you go to see the philadelphia the 24 pounder ball that the British was fired by a British gunboat um, was found lodged in the hull, was actually stuck in the hull. So that's, the, that's still there today. And you can see how it went. And those were, they were pr pretty thick planks on uh, the, the hull of the ship, but they went right through them. So that they were um, very fearsome. And they made a, they made a very, um, frightening noise. And they also would fire uh, double shot, which were what they called bar shot or chain shot that had two cannonballs connected by either a bar or a chain. And those would then spin as they went through and, and they would usually shoot them at the rigging of uh, other ships. And they would tear apart the sails and the ropes uh, as they went through had a wider range. Also a very frightening sound when they were approaching you. So if you have 44 men on one of those gunboats and a 24 pound cannonball, how much ammunition could you squeeze on there? Uh, well, th that was part of the problem is American Americans had, uh, you know, I think it wasn't so much the room as they just lacked the, um, the um, ammunition that they got as much ammunition as they could, particularly the gunpowder. Uh, Fort Ticonderoga was very short of gunpowder. They tried to keep that a big secret. In fact, Arnold knew it and uh, Horatio Gates knew it. Uh, they tried to prevent any of uh, their own soldiers from even finding out how short of gunpowder they were that summer. And it wasn't until at the very end of this, um, the campaign in the fall that they got some shipments, additional shipments of gunpowder. But that was the main uh, the cannonballs didn't take up an awful lot of room, but uh, they, um, the, the gunpowder was just not, you know, they didn't have it. So how long was the entire campaign from start to finish? Uh, well, it was really, if you start, the, they, they set their plan. They had a meeting in, on July 7th, um, and they, they, decided what they were going to do, build the fleet, uh, wait for the British to come down. And that was over on um, the, the battle was fought on the 11th to the 13th. And then the British, they were sure the British were gone by November 2nd. So it was basically four months. That seems fairly long, <laughs> especially if you're low on gunpowder. Yeah, well, it was most of it was waiting and building and and waiting some more. So, uh, what was morale like um, amongst the American troops specifically as they were waiting and building and waiting? Well, at uh, Fort Ticonderoga, General Gates did a very good business of uh, one of the problems they had with morale 
besides smallpox, besides having been beaten in Canada, was the rivalries. And it's hard to it's hard for us to understand because we think of oh, we're all in the live in the United States. These men were coming from all different colonies and they were very loyal to their colonies and they were they they thought you know and and was true of all in the early part of the war in particular when george washington came to boston he he thought he was coming to you know this was a bunch of low lifes and you know they, because they were from new england they he could hardly understand the way they talked they were dirty in his according to his uh, view of things um and there were all the uh, there were many serious rivalries that would break out into fights and brawls between the different units from the different colonies. So that was one of the morale factors they had. And, and Gates sent different units. It, it, he tried to divide them so they would, one unit would be in a certain area of the fort, and another another area. Um, the guys on the um, on the boats, I I really find hard to understand how they made it through that time of, you know, they're cold, they were wet. Um, you know, it was strict discipline as, you know, Arnold having been a sea captain, I mean, he was, it was the same. You had to have a pretty strong personality uh, to uh, make sure that the, the crew stayed in order and uh, they were constantly worked so that every day they'd get up and they'd go to work, whether training or rowing the boats around or, taking soundings or whatever it was so they were constantly active uh, and could spend their energy that way i guess <laughs> seems like a they kept the, themselves busy at any rate well they were kept busy uh, i don't <laughs> think they did it huh? they would have liked to break but uh, they and the other problem was that they could rarely go on land because Valkyr island they occasionally would land on Valkyr island let the guys get off and just be on land for a little while but the rest of um, the land up there, there were always British patrols, uh, and you never knew. There were a couple ambushes. The British tried to lure them on land and then ambush them, so they were very wary of going on land. So most of the time they were up there, they for this approximately six weeks, uh, they spent in the boats. You really had to develop your sea legs then if you're spending that much yeah. time on the water. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're not used to it. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so I have a couple more questions. Um, what was the most interesting thing that you found while you were doing research for this? Well, I, I guess I'd have to say that um, I was surprised how neglected it's been. And I, I, I usually cite... Um, a book by David McCullough uh, called 1776. And it's, it, it's an excellent book. Uh, it's one of the really good, you know, McCullough is a great historian, a great storyteller. And it was about the Revolutionary War in the year 1776. But there's not a single mention of anything having to do with the Northern Campaign at all in that book. And that was a book devoted to the war of that year. And it's puzzling. Uh, I know, you know, there are reasons for it, but uh, I think that was really the main thing. It's, and a lot of other books, a lot of histories of the war, uh, this campaign is either slighted or it's just ignored. Why do you think that is? Why do people tend to overlook it? Uh, I think that um, part one, one aspect of it, it was connected to the invasion of Canada. And the, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, that's considered as kind of a area we don't really want to get into. It's not the, one of the more um, uplifting parts of the war. But I think the main reason is really Benedict Arnold, that uh, it's very easy to forgive Washington his faults and then celebrate his uh, crossing the Delaware. Uh, but nobody wants to sing the praises of uh, Benedict Arnold. And um, that's really has put a damper on the interest in things that he did that were really were quite heroic. Okay, and uh, this is gonna be my last question, arguably my favorite and the most important. Um, if you could dine with anybody at France's Tavern, dead or alive, who would you choose? Um, hmm, 
Well, I guess I'd have to say Benedict Arnold. You know, I I think George Washington is a is a man of very high rectitude, but I think uh, Benedict Arnold would have been a, a um, interesting character to talk to because he was so complex and so conflicted and such a paradox. Uh, it would just be uh, interesting to try to um, have a few beers and uh, get into his head. Oh, I like that answer. That was a good one. <laughs> um, I also like that answer. I'm not quite a Benedict Arnold apologist, but I do think he's one of the most interesting uh, figures in the war. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, Allie, for hosting our Q&A. Thank you, Jack, for your great talk and all those incredible answers. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening and continuing to support programs at Francis Tavern Museum. If you enjoyed the program and you'd like to make a donation, you could do that on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. If you're looking for our next lecture, it's going to be on Thursday, May 6th. And if you've ever wondered what was happening in Florida during the war, I would encourage you to check it out. That's what we're going to be talking about. Um, another neglected uh, part of the history. Um, while you're on our website, again, francistavernmuseum.org, you can join our mailing list. You can follow us on social media to stay up to date on all of our programs and events. We are open to the public. If you're in New York and you want to visit, you can buy a ticket uh, to reserve your time slot. Otherwise, we will see you all hopefully at our next event. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you, Sarah.